Hey, hey, it's Patrick Coyle, Artist in Progress, and I suck at talking to other creators and getting mentorship. So today, I'm talking to a longtime friend, Bruce Zick. Bruce has made a career of being a concept artist in basically every animated movie you've ever seen. Bruce has also been a comic book writer and artist for the last 30 years. He's done work for Marvel, Caliber Press back in the day, Dark Horse, and several other companies. I've known Bruce for almost 20 years, and this is actually the first time we've ever sat and had a conversation. We've traded emails, we've traded phone messages, but we've never actually spoken before, which is ridiculous. So today we sit down and we talk about the life of a freelancer. We talk about how to get your start in animation, or how he got his start, Thundar the Barbarian. We talk about how concept artists work, and various other topics, including how to pronounce the Superman villain, Mixpatulk. Mixplixic? Mix. Pledic. I can't do it. Let's get into it. For those who don't know you, um, whether they're young artists, comic book artists, um, artists in training, what have you, how would you describe yourself as an artist? Like, what um, um, what is your profession within within uh, the entertainment industry? Well. Uh... I, I always wanted to do comic books. Yeah, uh, that's sort of the obsession that I had. You no, know, when I was in grade school, it was like, you know, I drew superheroes. I wanted to do comics, and I was sure I was gonna uh, work for Marvel someday. Mm -hmm. And um, you did. And that took a lot longer than I thought. <laughs> and uh, and I was really never a good, a good artist, honestly. I mean, I thought I was pretty good, and of course people usually do think they're pretty good uh, and I had no objectivities whatsoever but um, I got a job in animation uh, while I was pursuing my goal of being a comic book artist okay and uh, I applied at an animation studio that did Saturday morning cartoons in Los Angeles and I wanted to be a character designer, but they didn't really think my character designer stuff, my characters were that strong, okay. which I thought they were. So I ended up getting a job in the background design department. And I was fortunate enough to have an amazing teacher. And, and that's where I ended up kind of uh, nesting myself as, as a, a background designer, which now would be more called a concept artist. Basically. Okay. Okay. But back then, there, there was just Disney only doing features, and, right. and Saturday morning, oh, Don Bluth, no, um, Ralph Bakshi did a movie, and yeah, maybe some other feature came out by somebody else. Don Bluth hadn't split yet. Okay. And so uh, it was all Saturday morning cartoons was really where you made your, your, your living in animation. Okay. So... Um, and then I was lucky enough years later to uh, get a gig working. Uh, well, I guess my first gig was doing a four-parter in Dark Horse Presents. Oh. Uh, I, w I went to San Diego way back when, yeah. and met the guys at Dark Horse, and they liked my, my portfolio, and so they... Uh, gave me a gig doing a little four-parter series and, and then I got a, a gig working for um, TSR Gaming Company. Oh, yeah. Which also was producing comic books of their games and Stephen Grant was the writer on the book uh, called The Intruder. Intruder. And, and so I illustrated a series of books uh, that Stephen Grant was writing. And, and then I, I got to do uh, a gig with Caliber Press. Uh, I submitted a lot of work to them and did my first Zone Continuum series back in the 90s for Caliber. Right. And then kept pushing my stuff around, mailing out samples, and then I finally uh, got my foot in the door at Marvel. And so I just went back and forth between doing comic books and uh, working in animation as a, as a designer. And animation really paid great. And comic book pay was awful. <laughs> So I always needed to get back and uh, work on another animated movie just to kind of build up another nest egg and 
But um, the funny thing about concept art is you're working with a director and a producer and a handful of other people on the production. And they're the only ones who really look at your artwork and maybe they, they pin it up on some walls for the length of the production and then it's filed away in the vast warehouse of infinity. Right. Never to be seen again. So nobody in animation, uh, nobody outside of that handful of people ever sees the work you do in animation. And, and the thing I loved about comics was that's your work. Right. 100% you is on that page, every, every mistake, every little imperfection, but it's all you and people get to see what you do. So they both kind of satisfied different needs for me. And sure. even to today, all these years later, it's still sort of the same dynamic. Yeah, that makes sense. The, 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 you mentioned, you know, I would take my kids to go see, of course, all the new Pixar, all the new Disney uh, uh, theater uh, stuff in the theater, and then I'd see your name go by. And, uh, oh, you and got good eyes. <laughs> well, I, I had known that you worked on it. Either oh, okay. Shannon or you had mentioned it, and so I'd be looking for it. Uh, sometimes it, I I wouldn't know, and it would just go by. I love to watch the credits, anyways. Just mm -hmm. I don't know why. Um, and so I would say to my my daughter, I said, "Look, you see that name, Bruce Sick?" She goes, "Yeah." I said, "I know him." And then she says, "How do you know him?" I said, "Well, you remember that thing I told you I used to do with publishing? That uh, he he used to work with me on that stuff." She goes, "Wow!" And she said, "What did he do on this movie?" And I said, "I have no idea. We didn't <laughs> we didn't get to see it. All, all the work he did was kind of behind the scenes designing how it feels." Right. And right. it was hard to describe to her what what your job was on it because you know, it, like you said, it's not like comics where what you see is the result the direct result of, of your work yeah every now and then on movies you, i get the satisfaction of actually seeing something end up on the screen which is, is kind of shocking yeah um and a movie like hercules uh was probably my biggest satisfaction although titan ae uh, also was very satisfying and and a few other movies, but uh, generally speaking, you know, you have to lower your expectations when you finally go to the movie and understand that you're part of a collaboration of teamwork and yeah. your, your work in many ways contributes to what you end up seeing on the screen, but sometimes, or most of the time, not directly. Yeah. And this is actually a, a repeating theme um, that I'm finding in folks that I talk to, whether they're storyboard artists or character designers or concept um, artists like yourself, is that there's a lot of work that is kind of unsung, right? It's kind of, you know, obviously it's behind the scenes, but it's also not something that you, you know, uh, actually see the final product. Um, you sto storyboards, certainly, you don't see yeah. on the screen. You know, your concepts, like you said, you may or may not get something up on the screen. Um, character designers, you know, you I, I love, you know, you can see behind me all the all the making of books that oh, yeah, I have. Yeah. Um, and I love that stuff because, again, that's stuff that you just see, you know, development right. and ideas and you kind of see how things evolve and how they how they come to be. But, you know, like you, you see a list this long in the credits of the people who worked on it. And I don't know what what fraction of the work actually made it into the final concept. Yeah, I think I, I feel especially bad for people at uh, Pixar because every Pixar movie looks the same. Mm -hmm. It's all, I mean, the character designs fluctuate a little bit in des design concepts, but the world of Pixar movies is the same. Yeah. It's fairly real and uh, perspective is true. The grass is green, the sky is blue. You see every blade of grass, you see, you see every leaf on every tree, every building's got uh, the appropriate number of windows. It's as if somebody just took a camera and shot scenery and then uh, and then that became becomes the background world of a Pixar movie. Yeah. But, but yet, every movie, they hire designers to come up with ideas on what the world might look like. Right, and, and some of those people are staff artists uh, at, at Pixar, who year after year after year do the most beautiful, crazy concept ideas 
for wild imaginative environments, none of which ever even remotely are ever used, but that's their job. Right. And, and it's only in uh, looking at one of those books that you would go, oh my God, look at these wonderful ideas. Oh, right. that, why didn't it look like that? Right. And, and, and sometimes like the end credits or an opening sequence may be a little bit more graphically designed. Sure. And, and that's sort of a little bit of an effort to try to um, pay tribute to those artists who came up with all these wonderful design ideas. So it goes into the end credit sequence. Sure. Yeah, I, I'm thinking particularly on uh, Monsters, Inc. The opening right. looks like it's drawn with a colored pencil on paper, kind of cut out a little bit or something like that. And, that, and then uh, you see the production design stuff and it looks like that whereas like you said the rest of the movie is fully rendered you know yeah. kind of pixar house style right. um yeah that's got to be frustrating but and for those um who are watching who don't know i'm not going to make you talk about every project you ever worked on but i'm looking at your imdb page and you've worked on incredibles 2 you worked on hop uh wally valiant finding nemo titan a road to el dorado uh, Fantasia 2000, I should say. You're not that old for the original. Um, Prince of Egypt, Hercules, Pocahontas, Lion King, Rescuers Down Under, and on and on and on. Um, I, and I've seen most of that. Um, my favorite thing, though, on your IMDb page is Thunder the Barbarian. <laughs> um, you know what? <laughs> that is a, a beloved series. It's It's to this day loved by so many people and I think the following is bigger than a lot of people understand and I can't grok why nobody's doing a revival of with Thundar. I've wondered that too. I mean it seems ripe for a redo. Um, yeah, exactly. I was I was 11 when that show came out and it was it was, you know, it had a little taste of Star Wars and a little taste of Conan and a little taste of Commandy and some other yeah. things that I had been exposed to. And it was just like this this beautiful little blend. Um, and he used huh. to say things like demon dogs and uh, um, yeah. and it had Ukla, who was kind of like Chewbacca. And uh, yeah. Yeah. it was just a wonderful, I loved it. I mean, Saturday morning um, can't be replicated these days, right? It's that, that, that was considered a, a pretty high quality production. They, they spent a lot of money on that. And, the, and and you probably know they had Jack Kirby. Yeah. Doing the concept designs for it. Yep. And uh, Steve Gerber was one of the, the head writers on that show. And yeah. uh, that's where I met Jack Kirby for the first time. And, oh, nice. Uh, I, I tentatively was showing him a few of my drawings <laughs> to <laughs> hear him say something nice about me. But uh, he, every week, he, his wife drove him to Ruby Spears Studio. Yep. And he had his black uh, portfolio case under his arm, and he would just bring in that week's batch of drawings for another episode. Oh, uh, okay. Um, but yeah, that that was an excellent project. I, I actually tried out to do the voice work for the opening credit sequence. Really? It was something like the year 1999, a runaway planet hurtling between in the earth and the moon unleashes cosmic destruction. Mankind is cast into ruin. And it was the narration that, that uh, opens every episode. And yeah. So I, I, I was uh, hoping I could maybe get a second job as like doing voice work but uh, <laughs> they decided for somebody else for some reason uh, i don't know why but uh, dashed your hopes on the rocks and did you go to school for art no well kind of i mean i i took some classes in college and then i dropped out of college okay um and then i i would just uh i studied i i drew a lot all the time from books and things but uh, and then I would occasionally go to figure drawing classes and, you know, study things out of books again. And um, when that very first Disney uh, book on animation came out, the real big, heavy, square kind of shape, one with the white cover and a kind yeah. of cut out of Mickey. You know, when that first came out and, and that was the first time we could really see production art of, of movies, all those beautiful pencil renderings from Pinocchio and all that productions. 
that really kind of influenced me pretty heavily to, to even conceive of the idea of uh, being in animation. But what really uh, was fortunate for me was when I got my first job at Ruby Spears, uh, I, I honestly, I mean, if you think you suck at drawing, <laughs> which I, I would dispute that you really don't suck at drawing, but thank you. Uh, if I showed you my very, I, I really sucked at drawing when I got my job. And I don't honestly know how I got the job, but except that they needed people very desperately because uh, they had suddenly expanded production that year and they couldn't find warm bodies to hold pencil. So I was lucky to get the job and it was a union job back then. And they start you off as like an assistant or an apprentice. Okay. And, and the apprentice position, you literally train under your supervisor who teaches you. So it was like going to school, but getting paid to still at the same time be doing work for the studio. But my boss taught me how to draw. And I, I uh, was just so fortunate to have had uh, really one of the best artists in the whole business as my teacher. What was his name? His name's Dave High, H-I-G-H. Nobody's heard of him. He was just <clears throat> one of those quiet professionals who sat at his desk and uh, punched in a time clock and uh, punched out at the end of the day and sat and did his work and, and was brilliant. Hmm. I mean, absolutely brilliant. So I, I just couldn't have asked for a better situation, really. That's fantastic. Yeah, uh, yeah. So what you do is, you know, for a year or two, you're an apprentice, and then uh, they move you up to uh, like an assistant. Okay. Uh, and then you you get like another 50 bucks a week, and your, your pay <laughs> increases. And then uh, you end up, uh, then I think like being a uh, level one journeyman or eventually you become a full level journeyman okay which was the highest paid union type category I see. And, and then right around that time i started going freelance and then uh after about five years of that and then from that point on i just sort of stayed in freelance uh yeah. mode for the most part okay yeah i mean that you bring up a good point so you've been a freelancer pretty much your entire career more right. or less right how does, you know, one of the things when, when I got out of school, I went to school for illustration and I graduated in the early 90s. And one of the things that I kind of freaked out about when I got out of school was the freelancing life. It sucks being a freelancer. It's, uh, I mean, you know, you have good years and you have terrible years and you're always, you're always insecure. Uh, I think, you know, when I lived in Los Angeles, um, there were a period of many years where, because I was there, I was in that environment, um, I could sort of just keep getting work. Mm -hmm. uh, but then when I moved out of Los Angeles to live up here in Oregon, I was a freelancer far removed. And, and that's where it became even more difficult. And um, it, as much as I had so many contacts uh, that I'd generated from the years in Los Angeles, living further away really impacted your ability to get work. Sure. And so I would have, I'd have great years and then I would have terrible years and I never knew what was coming next, which was what was good about also being in the comic business was um, I could sort of eke an existence out doing comic book work, uh, especially in the times when I wasn't getting uh, any movie work so whoa oh. is that thunder yeah oh wow yeah, we, we've been having a drought this year and now all of a sudden it's hailing and pouring and lightning and thunder wow uh, so i hope i hope our can i hope the power doesn't go out oh no <laughs> <laughs> so um i i don't i mean you could you know everybody's different so uh I, I think for me, it, it's just always been hard, but yeah. it's all also allowed me to live a life that I want to live. Okay. And, and so, uh, and, I, and I, 
consider myself very fortunate still. Okay. So, I mean, you've worked pretty steadily and I understand that, you know, each year kind of ebbs and flows, but for instance, like doing visual development work, like if you, and I, I'm sure it varies from project to project, but how long is a, is a stint on one of those projects? Like uh, oh. Incredibles or WALL-E or, you know, one of the Disney yeah. projects? Well, it could be, uh, well, you know, it could be a year or eight months on a, on a film project, sometimes a little bit more. Or it could just be like six weeks. Oh, okay. Yeah, it's just like, well, uh, we need you to do this one thing and then uh, we're done. <laughs> so, um, and I think, well, the nature of the business has changed a lot since when I first started. It, when I was early into it, it was more on the model of, of the old Walt Disney format of making a movie where okay gang we've got a new movie and let's get some artists and let's let them experiment and just play and explore ideas for months and months and months and then uh, we'll have all this artwork up everywhere and we'll have all this rooms full of inspiring artwork to envelop the team in and we'll eventually kind of decide which direction we want to go, we'll narrow it down, and then we'll go into production. So I, I got to do that for many years. I would start on a, a Disney movie and I'd just be, you know, on my own making up stuff, sending it in, getting input from the directors, but the directors and the producer, they, they wanted to give you a, a, a wide berth and let you see what you came up with so it was all very um exploratory for me and very rewarding and then uh production would maybe start six months later and then you might be on for another six or eight months uh in production okay and that now more <laughs> it's like uh oh, we got a new movie uh we need this shot we need that shot we need this shot <laughs> and just do it they're not interested in style exploration because it's all going to look computer generated like the real world so right uh, there, there's no need to you know every disney movie in the past had a completely different look which right. was the art of animation you right. know, to go from sleeping beauty to 101 dalmatian i mean you, you couldn't imagine two more extremely different movies in, in style. And, and it took a lot of work to make a movie look unique like that. And that was the legacy of Disney back then was he, he really uh, felt that animation was an art form, sure. like a capital A art form. And so he, he encouraged the process to create beautiful movies. Yep. Yep. Yeah, it doesn't it doesn't quite work that way anymore, does it? Um, I mean, I don't want this to sound like a well, they don't make them like they used to kind of conversation. But well, you know, yeah, and and in all fairness, I mean, the, the artists that do movies, I, you know, I don't want to get on my soapbox too much, but um, I mean, the movies are are amazing movies now, and and the the technical abilities of of the artists and the craftsmen. You know, the, the uh, use of lighting and atmospherics and the color palettes, you know, there, there's a lot of absolutely amazing work in movies. I, 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 I think, you know, we've lost a certain quality in one area, but we've gained abilities in other areas maybe to compensate somewhat. Yeah. Yeah. But I do feel that the holy grail of computer animated movies for many years has been to uh, conquer realism. Yeah. And, and now I feel like they really have conquered realism to the point where, where do you go now? I right. mean, we, is this just going to be the way everything's going to look now for eternity? Or <laughs> are we going to start asking other kind of questions or have other kind of mission statements? Yeah. And maybe at this point, 
things will go more in in a capital A art new direction that takes the technical genius of what they're doing now and but the artistic exploration of what they used to do. It's going to take a breakthrough movie that pushes the boundaries for people to start going, oh, look, well, that made a lot of money, so maybe we can do more of that. Right. So. Yeah, the, the Leica movies are um, stop motion. I know one of them was 3D made to look like stop motion, um, but um, they're pretty highly stylized, but they're also not doing Disney numbers. Yeah. Oh um, no, they they I think um, yeah for a lot of reasons their their stories are not and ideas are not connecting to people. Yeah, but the quality of the of the visuals and the storytelling is fantastic. Yeah, um, and they, they have an absolutely mind-bogglingly complex system of production. I uh, I was taken on a tour there, and you wouldn't believe the the technical difficulties of their movies. Oh, really? just, oh, I mean, they've got tens of thousands of those replaceable head parts that I don't know where they put them all at the end of a movie, but uh, they they it's they're all being 3D printed and uh, but but every every movie is computer animated first as a guide to give the 3D model machines the data to print everything again as a 3D head, head for instance. Oh, really? Or body, and then it's animated as stop action, but initially it was animated in computer animation first. Huh. So they're like making two movies to make <laughs> one movie. Man, That's so, incredible. Crazy. You would never think that a studio would okay that. They're like, we're not yeah. going to shoot a film twice. Yeah. And, and the funny thing is, I mean, like Tim Burton, uh, Nightmare Before Christmas is is now a classic. Yeah. Whereas no no Leica movie really that I'm aware of, and I could be wrong, uh, no Leica movie maybe is considered a timeless classic that people watch over and over and over and over again. Yeah, I don't, I don't think so. My Nightmare own... Before Christmas is... And there's like maybe six replaceable head parts <laughs> for their characters. Right. Uh, they, they, or maybe 10, I don't know. There's like mouth open, mouth closed. That It's super limited stop motion uh, animation, but it's the storytelling uh, that's superb. You mentioned, you know, having a freelance lifestyle gave you the ability to kind of live the life that you wanted. What What is it about freelancing or what, what did that enable for you? Like, oh, well, I, I uh, moved years ago out to the country. Okay. And so now I'm uh, outside of Portland and I'm on about 20 acres of kind of forest. Ooh. And I uh, have a lot of outbuildings. Uh, this where I'm at right now is an outbuilding and there's a, like a pole barn and there's, there's a, lot, a lot of different buildings. And, uh, and I just love being outdoors and managing things. I've got dogs and cats, a wife, a child, um, and uh, not necessarily in that order. But, <laughs> right. uh, I, I just love to be able to step out and do some landscaping or you know, every season of the year has different um, appeal. And when the fall comes, there's trees to cut and wood to chop and kind of putting everything to bed and collecting things out and versus this time of year everything is exploding and there's all this work to do and all this landscaping and uh and going i just i just love living like this and um and being at home uh to work means that it's just a step away sure so if i work for a while and i just uh, you know after like two or three hours I just want to get out of my chair and get out of the office and just go outside and do something for a while and and I can so uh, it's very it's very nurturing in, in, in that way and it's pretty it's priceless really to be able to do that that's fantastic so you're kind of out in the you know by design you're out in the middle of uh, nowhere by yourself 
uh, well, yeah. with your family, I should say, not just by yourself. But, um, you know, I've talked to a couple other people and, you know, being an artist, unless you're in a studio with other folks, is a pretty solitary existence. Yeah. Um, I mean, do you, um, does that work for you? Do you miss being well, around? No, I, I mean, I, yes and no, but I never really wanted it to be like this. Okay. I, I actually, uh, I was, uh, always drawn to the idea that someday I would have a large enough business that I would have people working for me and and that's happened periodically I've had uh, like an office manager or a production assistant or a couple artists for cleanup mm -hmm. but it never lasted too long but I always thought that, that would be more of what I would do is I'd have the business out in the country but there it would be a social scenario okay and when i was uh getting ready to move from los angeles i i was doing a lot of a lot of comic book work and i thought the comic book part of things was really going to take off i was doing a, a 12 book series for a company called Kamiko. oh sure yep. and um and so to do a 12 book series um, and and have it come out each month meant that you had this sort of pyramiding arc of, of production going on. Mm -hmm. Like uh, the first issue, you, the first weeks, you're just working on the first book, but at some point, well, you've got to start the script on number two while you're working on number one so that and then at some point when you're doing the inks on the first book, you've got to be um, starting the pencils on the second book, but you've got to be writing the third book. And and then a few months further in, you're, you're coloring book number four, you're penciling book number two, you're inking number one, you're writing number five, you're overseeing the letter. You know, it becomes this vastly pyramiding amount of production that involves a lot of people. So I was going to move to port to outside of Portland, and I was going to have a, like a comic book company almost. You know, mm -hmm. I just thought this was the beginning of a new lifestyle. Sure. And uh, shortly after that, Kamiko went bankrupt. <laughs> so, <laughs> the long story became a short story, and, uh, yeah. and boohoo! But uh, <laughs> so that didn't that didn't quite happen. No, that's unfortunate. Um, but yeah, I mean, you hear about a lot of people, it, it doesn't, I listened to a lot of interviews of uh, modern uh, guys who work for Marvel and DC now, and they don't seem to kind of work, certainly not not like Jack Kirby and his contemporaries, they, 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 which is, it was a gig, and they were doing like volume, like they were pumping out books every day and working together back to back in the small, you know, cramped quarters in New York City and that kind of thing. But then you started in the 60s and 70s. To, to hear from like um, Storenko and uh, Neil Adams and some of the other guys, Continuity, and had their own studios. And they just what you described, which is um, you've got a bunch of people working for you, some more junior, some more senior, but all under like this kind of, um, you know, house brand name. Right. So right. Um, but producing good quality stuff, um, oh but somebody, you know, aping Neil Adams' style um, and it was more of a production thing and they were becoming their own little Stan Lee's in their own, in their own way right um, and that worked out great for some folks and not others but you yeah. don't hear people doing that too much right. anymore. well yeah I mean I maybe uh, I don't know if when the image broke broke away did they uh, all get together in, uh, in some facility and all sort of start start yeah. a comic book company in that model that you're describing yeah that's a that's a good point so um shannon our mutual friend um used to work for rob liefeld um and so uh in the ask him about that. early to mid 90s yeah you should it's a it's a he's got a lot of good stories um and that was actually now that you mention it sort of like what I, what we're talking about which you know rob is at the top of that food chain and there's a whole bunch of guys who work for him they've got you know, art directors and managers and um, production folk. And then there's the the junior people, which at the time Shannon was one of them, um, learning how to do comics and doing backgrounds and, you know, doing all that kind of fun stuff. Um, I don't know. I mean, you hear like 
Robert Kirkman has Skybound right now. Like, uh, there's a lot of the sub, almost like production companies within the the studio that is Image. I guess if you want to make a parallel yeah. parallel to the to motion picture industry. But um, I can't believe I just said motion picture industry. Like I'm a like I'm Louis B. Mayer. This is <laughs> 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 the movie movie industry. Um, that uh, it, it it is interesting that that was what you're describing was like a uh, a a common you know business plan that mm-hmm. that that worked for a lot of folks. And then I I think yeah. it happens more now by happenstance than it does by by uh, plan. Yeah, my my I could only guess that. Um, I mean, it's a, it's there's people that are slow at you know penciling and inking, and it's it's hard work, and and people do beautiful pages, but I'm thinking nowadays there's a lot more preciousness and love of the page, and and pouring your heart and soul into every panel kind of approach. There's a lot more love of the medium. And so you just don't produce as much. It takes a day to do a page or maybe, you know, maybe you get that book out once, yeah, or a 20 some page book a month is all consuming. So it's all you can do to just meet that deadline and let alone, try to be a boss and do other things and over, you know try to do two books a month and delegate some of it and oversee things and mm-hmm. i think in years past like what you were saying uh a while ago it was more like a job yeah uh, i mean the, the greats like all all the people we admire that created the the business like jack kirby i mean they they just happened to be brilliant so but it wasn't like I think they loved every, you know, they loved the comic book form. They loved uh, every panel that they drew. They, they were just trying to make a living yeah. and feed their family and go as fast as they could. It just so happened that they were brilliant and, and their stuff was magnificent. Um, and like Neil Adams and uh, Steve Ditko and people like that, or even, yeah. even Wally Wood for a long time. Right. But, um, right. but uh, I don't. I, I don't keep up with comics so uh, like I should, so yeah. I, I'm now in a completely ignorant uh, vacuum of <laughs> knowing what's being done. But my 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 sense of it is, uh, at least in in the bigger books and the bigger companies, that the artists are um, more wrapped up in the beauty of the art form. Yeah, right. And I think yeah, there's always a voice in the back of our heads. I'm doing a comic book. I'm doing a comic book. I'm sitting here. I'm doing it right. Oh my God! I'm doing a panel. I'm drawing a figure. At, at, versus the earlier generation was, oh, I need the paycheck. I got to get two more pages done today. I got to take the kids to school, and and uh, you know I'm getting fifty dollars a page, and right. <laughs> you know, I can barely make it. Right. <laughs> I think yeah. I think that's a, an excellent point. One thing that I wanted to talk to you about is Zone Continuum. One thing that always struck me with Zone Continuum is I remember when I first saw it and I was like, holy, this is like, (laughs) it's so, uh, it just feels like it poured out of you onto the page. It's very rich. There's a, it feels like it's um, like you thought of a ton of details and elements that went into it. Like, um, and frankly, all of your work feels that way. It feels very big and bombastic and oh, and dynamic. Um, and I, it all feels wonderful in that way to me. Is that Was that something that you set out to do or did you kind of find yourself there eventually? Well, I think um, because I, I had a, biz- a career in animation, sort of world building, and creating the environments of a movie, I, I fell in love with a rich environment for stories. So I went, I sort of took that into comics and wanted the comic stories to occupy that same kind of really fleshed out detailed world. And, and of course, uh, I was single at the time and my rent was peanuts and I didn't have, you know, a big overhead nut every month to pay. So 
you could you could just like do nothing else but work, work on comics seven days a week and stay up late and drink uh, tons of coffee every day and, and just just throw yourself get into uh, the zone so to speak of, you know just fo being focused so much without distraction into your work and so and then because the zone was one of was my first uh, creator on book okay i really did want to put a lot into it uh, but i really did love the environment because uh working in movies a lot i grew to love architecture and especially like a metropolis kind of world of architecture and rooftops yeah primarily, uh, yeah. Uh, in a metropolis so that was a big uh, motivation for me to want to do that storyline was to put it in that world Therefore, I really wanted to, to pour myself into it and flesh it out. Um, and and uh, interestingly, um, I did a new zone continuum graphic novel about four or five years ago with Dark Horse. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, so I, I picked it back up again after 20 some years. And I'm now doing new zone continuums. But I kind of miss those days when I had nothing else in my life to do but just do this book and now I've got all these competing voices in my head oh you got to do this got to do camp to I can't spend too much time on each page like I would like to I gotta have a little bit more of a practicality and a sense of economy yep. uh, and reality about um, meeting the deadlines and just getting the damn thing done yeah so uh, it becomes a different kind of um, operation and so uh, which is good too but uh, sometimes I just wish I I could just stay up all night and drink coffee and 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 just fall in love with um, getting into the zone of the world of your book sure yeah I mean I I, I could totally appreciate that I used to have um, well I'm a, I'm a night owl I don't know about you but so I used to be able to stay up all night working on stuff and then I would sleep, you know, until the afternoon after the sun came up. Sure. Um, and then, um, but then I had kids. Um, and so now my body clock has to be, you know, uh -huh. I get up at 6.30, get them on the bus, I do my day job. I'm there too. Yeah. Stuff, you know. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Um, and I, I do miss that. Like what I loved was that um, uh, just a, what they call now flow, right? It's yeah, or yeah. you're in the zone or flow is yeah. you just there's nothing else around. It's you, and that's why I loved doing it in the middle of the night because no one would bother you. Right. Um, you know, no one would the, the phone wouldn't ring. This is uh, even before cell phones too. But um, and you would just put on some music and you would just you know be into it, and it was just right. you, and you'd kind of lose your sense of self even. Mm -hmm. Like it was. Yeah. It was wonderful, and I'm to be able to bring tears to my eyes, I'm <laughs> nostalgic. <laughs> <laughs> but I've been chasing that dragon, you know, for you know oh, almost yeah. thirty years now. Um, I haven't. You you find pockets of it here and there, um, and I'm I'm hoping to get some of that back, you know, once I really focus on on making comics uh, full time. Well, it brings me back to a, a question you asked a while ago about uh, working at home in solitude. Uh, and I, I do want to say the, the, the best thing about that is you, uh, at least for the time you're in your workspace uh, at home all by yourself, you, you do have uh, uh, no distractions, hopefully you don't, or you, you, it's minimal. Whereas if you're working with other people, it is distracting. Yeah. It is. It, it, there's always a lot of goofing off and just socializing and and uh, joy shared with other fellow artists, which is uh, camaraderie is a great thing like that. Sure. Um, but you know, to get into that place you're talking about, uh, hopefully you you can have at least it's sort of like warming up, uh, like a, if you're a musician. You know, you just want to have a couple hours to kind of get loosened up a little bit, have the music go on, have the blinders on, and then you get almost like an alpha state 
uh, with your brain waves, and then you can ride that rhythm, hopefully for as long as you can. Uh, and, you know, you you have a better chance of doing that when you work by yourself. Yeah. Versus, uh, and I think it takes a, a kind of a brilliant talent to say be a business manager or operator of, of your company wearing a lot of different hats and being productive I yeah. mean, sort of like imagine will eisner right i mean his, his work was just brilliant but he was running a shop that's right he had assistants and that but his he, he he could wear all those different hats it's true you would think looking at the amount of work that he pumped out and the quality of that work that he was just a, a art board 24 7. but right. you're right he i mean he had what we were talking about before he had this full studio of people and he was producing a bunch of different strips and worked with a bunch of different people and he was the man in charge like he was from all from all uh, accounts that i've heard is like he, he wasn't you know just the name on the door he was making it happen well it's hard to imagine that i don't remember there's seven eight page stories but yeah he was doing one of those a week yeah fully produced to go into that sunday uh a sunday insert in the that's right funny section yep. for the comics is that. <laughs> and uh and so that was again you know you're working on this one but you're writing the script for maybe four weeks ahead and uh, you know you're operating a flow chart that's right as a as a manager as well as being an artist so yeah that's a lot that's a lot um well i have two last questions for you i think they're relatively short but we'll you'll you'll be the judge of that we'll see if we stretch those out <laughs> <laughs> so you know you mentioned it earlier um you know the name of this show is patrick sucks at drawing it's it's tongue-in-cheek it's it's supposed to be about the fact that there's always a, a part of you and I, this is the collective you as, as an artist that has that voice in the back of your head that says you suck right so oh, totally. within your world you know uh, uh, artistically speaking what do you feel that you suck at well everything actually <laughs> um, i think you know there's a an ideal image in my head like say when i start a new page or a, even a panel or just some kind of piece of art there's an ideal version of it that i'm fantasizing about <laughs> that is what it's going to be yeah and and uh and then you just don't achieve that you you compromise and you settle for some you know very rarely do i i get that pleasure of going oh this is what i thought it was going to be this is as good <laughs> as that that first image sure sometimes it happens and it's just the greatest feeling in the world but yeah i, I think i'm you know 90 some percent of the time it's disappointing uh, yeah to to not achieve that that image that you were after that your hopes and <laughs> were all resting on so um and then you know here here's here's the big thing too is talking about sucking uh there's a monday to friday rhythm that's really brutal and and let's just say we we've spent Okay, we'll start, start Monday. Monday sucks because you've taken a couple days off with your family or your life and the weekend. And for me, it's like, if I don't do it every day, endless hours every day, I lose all that momentum. Sure. And so coming in on Monday, it's like, if I look at what I did Friday. I don't know who that person was that did that artwork on Friday because I am nowhere near that in my head whatsoever on Monday morning. It's just like I'm I'm uh, a, a an, animating a lifeless corpse, uh, trying to almost reboot my brain to relearn everything about drawing there is to learn to do what I need to do on Monday. Yeah. And so Monday is terribly depressing. And, <laughs> and it, Tuesday is a little bit better, but so like at the end of Monday, you got a little bit better, but then bam, Tuesday morning, and I'm not even as good as I was yesterday evening, but so there's this up and down rhythm throughout the week. Each day is getting better, a little worse, a little bit better, a little worse. And then you finally get the rhythm of Friday and it's just 
finally you got that momentum going and when you you're really feeling like you're mastering it and then your week's over and then it's time to start all over again <laughs> Monday, <laughs> next Monday. and it's really depressing i i honestly go through that and and i just need so much warm-up time to get loosened to get my brain firing sure sure yeah i mean you see particularly on um, instagram and the other social media stuff people post a lot of their warm-ups and and cool downs uh, uh -huh. you know from the beginning and end of the day just because they're easy things to post or they can't they can't post what they're really working on because of ngas sure. or whatever um and it's it's funny like you see you know, people like yourself who've been a professional for a long time and worked on, you know, well-known projects. Um, but we still always have that, that those those demons that we wrestle with every day. Yeah. Yeah, I, I sure wish uh, I, I was built a little bit differently to not go through that. But so there's a lot of insecurity. And then underneath all of that is the, the, the notion that every artist has a... A, a lifespan of, of being talented. Some people uh, maybe go forever until they die, but most artists, you know, they peak out at some point. Whether you're a musician, a writer, an artist, an illustrator, you you have your best years, and then you have <laughs> the years uh, that you know are, are leading to the the terrible decline. And and so I I I think of like the sitting at the drawing board is like going to the climb up the hill to the water the well the water well at the top i'm going to get up there for the morning and i'm going to lower that bucket down and pray there's water in that well to bring up for that day because it's not guaranteed that you're just going to be every day always year after year always doing your greatest work ever and and so, um, you know, I just go up that hill every day and lower that bucket down there and try to pull some more water up. Hope he gets that water. <laughs> yeah, you're right. I mean, it's it's uh, Sisyphusian, if I can use a uh, yeah. crazy sounding word. Um, it's pushing that. That's right. Wasn't that he pushing the boulder up the hill every day? Yeah, myth of, myth of Sisyphus. Sisyphus. <laughs> Sisyphus. Myth of Sisyphus. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And there was Mr. Sisyphus, and then there was Mrs. Sisyphus, and, then, and there was the myth of Mrs. Sisyphus. Now, what if Sisyphus met Mixpatolk? I think that would be, or Mixoplexic. Mix, yes, Piddling. Yeah, that's right. Mixing, everyone, yeah. I'm now, always told that. an actual letter in a Superman comic years ago. How do you, what is the correct pronunciation of this guy? And they answered with Mix, yes, Piddle, Ick. That's the correct pronunciation. <laughs> a bit of trivia there. <laughs> Use I had information. As a boy, I had one of those um, uh, records that was a Superman story on each side, and you flip it over, and it had also had a little booklet um, yeah. that probably dumped some by somebody in the production department. Um, but they pronounced uh, Mixioplexic incorrectly, which cool. is which is why I pronounce it incorrectly. Uh, the whole time they called him Mixoplex. Uh, okay, but apparently nobody at DC was uh, checking in on the people making the with the record. But yeah. uh, so is it Submariner or Submariner? I call him Submariner. Submariner. Okay. But I've also heard people say Submariner. I think it's just yeah. wh whatever you had in your head the first time you read it. Right. It sticks. Yeah. Um, uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, there, there are no wrong answers in the world of comics. Right. Yeah. Um. All right, I have one last uh, question for the folks. We have a lot of people, a um, lot is a relative term, but the people watching this are, many of them are artists who are just starting out or trying to get their own kind of thing going like like I'm doing. What would you tell artists who are just getting started? Um, uh, do you have like one little piece of-, uh, of Oh, sure. Yeah, this is actually uh, something I recommend a lot, which is, uh, have a have a fallback. You know, have have a useful <laughs> have a useful skill <laughs> that can earn you some income that you can fall back onto. Because um, 
it is it is a hard unpredictable lifestyle being an artist in whatever field of art you're in and you do have good and bad years and and you have not very much control over where your work's coming from and if you want to make it you want to be there for the long haul you need to be at it for years and years and years and years to become uh, as good as you want to be and if you don't have that fallback where you're going through a couple bad months and okay well i'll go wait tables or or uh, i can get a job in construction or uh, i know how to do some plumbing i can do some what, 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 whatever. Uh, if you have that fallback, then you, you can stay with it and hang in through the rough times. Whereas a lot of artists, they put all their money on number seven and at the craps table or whatever. Or, um, they, they just um, have no fallback positions. So maybe two years, three years, they're kind of getting good, but oh, the work's not coming in, and I just can't do this anymore. I'm fed up with it. I'm I'm getting a real job, and and I'm I just I just don't want to suffer through this unpredictability because uh, it eats away at, at you. Sure. So um, being versatile. Uh, is a great thing uh, uh, or being versatile as an artist where oh, maybe you can do some commercial work some some logo designing some website building or right. you know, you ha have a variety of skills uh, and the closer those skills are to the area of your interest as an artist I mean the better yet right so uh, if you if you have that then you can hang in there for the long run and become that better version of yourself it's a it, it can be extremely rewarding doing what, what we do it, it can be yeah and i i think you're right i think um you know what you mentioned earlier about being a freelance giving you the life that you wanted uh, i've said this in other in other conversations but comics can be what you want it to be what you make of it uh, mm -hmm. or animation for that matter i guess too but um comics is nice in that there's no um I mean, yes, you could be a penciler from Marvel working on Spider-Man. I mean, that's kind of like the top of the, or, or Spider-Man, or I'm sorry, or Superman or Batman or whatever. Um, or you can just put out your own stuff at your own pace um, and not have to worry about any of that other baloney. And it's it can be just as fulfilling. Well, there's there certainly is very little as satisfying as doing your own book. Yeah. I mean, you are you wear so many hats. You're the writer, the producer, the director. You you do every shot. You're the like you're the storyboard artist. You're the set decorator. You're the cinematographer. You're the you're you're the actors. I mean, every panel involves all those dozens of decisions that require all these different kind of skills. But all along, it's like when it's your story. You know, it, it's that's the greatest feeling to, to be uh, in charge of your own uh, book. Yeah. So it, uh, yeah, it's, it's nothing like it, really. I mean, yeah, I, growing up, I always was like, ooh, it would be great to work for Marvel or do a, do a Batman story. But now I don't, I don't think I want that life. It's um, brutal. Yeah. It's brutal. And, you know, uh, I, I know we're going, going over now, but when, uh, I mean, I always wanted to work for Marvel. I, I yeah. pursued Marvel for so many years. I went to New York with some friends of mine, and we, we sat outside the Marvel office waiting for Stan Lee to come up the <laughs> elevator so I could show him my artwork. I mean, I send them stuff in all the time. Uh, I finally got to work on Thor. Yeah. It was awful. <laughs> oh, it was no. One of the worst experiences uh, uh, of my life. Really? Um, yeah, oh, that was so depressing. And so, you know, be careful what you wish for and 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 compare that experience to working on my own books. You know, working on my own books is, is so great. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and what I love about Zone Continuum is, you know, I've seen more of your quote unquote commercial work. I mean, con conceptual work is, I wouldn't say commercial, right? But I've seen, yeah. but, but Zone Continuum is seems to me, undiluted Bruce Zick 
Right. Like it's just, it's just <laughs> That's a scary thought. you know, straight out of your uh, subconscious uh, yeah. onto the page. Uh, yeah. and, it, and it it's wonderful in that way. Um, it's, uh, and I look forward to, I don't know how my books are really going to reflect what's in here, um, but I'm looking forward to finding out. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah, well, you you have no one but yourself to to blame. <laughs> <laughs> but no, you I I know you will I you'll have that love for it, and and especially because you waited twelve years or yeah. fifteen years. Yeah. So uh, yeah, I can't wait to see what you do. Thank you so much for spending time with me and and talking to me on Patrick uh, Sucks at Drawing. Well, thank you very much, Patrick, for inviting me on, and 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 uh, thank you for giving me a chance to meet you. Yeah. After knowing you for I don't know what twenty years, I guess. No, right. To meet you. So, uh, best of luck, and and we should stay in touch. And, Absolutely, I would I would like that very much. And I'll I'll look forward to seeing what you're doing, and I'll keep you up to date with what I'm doing. And, Excellent. And, uh, we'll go from there. So that was my conversation with Bruce. What'd you think? Did anything there ring a bell with you or make you think about being a concept artist? Did you even know what a concept artist was before this? Let me know down in the comments, won't you? And remember, as always, you don't suck. You just think you do. And you're wrong. All right, I'll see you next time. Keep writing, drawing, scrivening, digging, sculpting, whatever it is you do. Peace.